Hello and welcome back to Read Becca. Have you ever read something that was just so powerful and moving that you were almost having difficulty talking about it and raving about it even though you loved it? That is where I'm at with these two books, both of them, uh, Women Talking and All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Taves. I was so lucky to get Women Talking for my booktube spin number two pick and then all, all My Puny Sorrows for my booktube spin number four pick because I had put Miriam Taves on my list, a big chunk of her work, as selections for my spin picks a couple times around. And I had read Women Talking in 2019, I think, when it came out and just absolutely adored it. And so after that, I, I bought a whole bunch of her work. That's why I had it to, to put on the list. And so this was a reread for me and was every bit as absorbing and powerful. Then I read All My Puny Sorrows for the first time. And yet again, it had the same quality of just really reaching into you and getting to the heart of what it was discussing in funny and poignant ways. So I loved both of these books so much that I've really struggled with coming back around to review because I, I finished up both of these in 2021. So clearly we're a little ways out, but I really want to do them justice. And I, I hope I will get across at least some of it so that you can go experience what's truly great about these yourself. So Women Talking is the story of a very isolated Mennonite colony, the Malachna colony, and specifically the women of this colony believed they were having a shared dream for years, and it turned out it was not in fact a dream. They were being drugged and raped in the night for a period of about three years. And finally, one of the women caught the man entering her room, and um, they arrested all of the men who were doing this, and now because these are so isolated communities, um, the men of the colony have gone to the jail to bail out the men that perpetrated these crimes because they don't really think they should be in jail outside of the colony. Um, they think they should be bringing them back. And so the women are there discussing now what they want to do about this situation that they're in if these these men who were mistreating them are allowed back in the colony. What should they do? Should they do nothing? Should they leave? Should they stay and fight for their colony and their community? And so this is a very philosophical discussion between these women. Um, they, they have no education. They speak a language in their colony that is specific to the Mennonite communities, and it's not a written language. So they don't have the ability to speak to anyone outside of their colony or read and write. So in order to get this story, what we have is uh, a man who is a school teacher there because he, he had left the colony and kind of ingratiated himself to come back, um, but is sort of a sub man to the other men because he's not a farmer or rancher. He is the school teacher and had convinced them the value of education for their sons and the ability to read and write in dealing with the outside community. And so, so he is there as this outside perspective, transcribing and translating, because he's having to put this into a written language, uh, transcribing the meeting. And so he's getting all the fine details of what's going on in these women's interactions as they discuss these philosophical questions. So what's being discussed there is really contextualized in the ways that they understand. They live in a, um, a very kind of primitive for us, not technologically advanced society. They are living on rural farms. And so they are contextualizing things about animals that they care for and the way that their animals would deal with problems. Um, so in many ways, they start from a place of are women animals because they are not, uh, according to their society, equal to men. And so they're grappling with that question. Can animals go to heaven? Because their faith is so important to them. So if they are animals, can they go to heaven? If they, if they are an animal or if they're not, if they don't forgive the men, does that jeopardize their, their ability to go to heaven? So they're grappling with these really major questions about the identity of, of these of women in their context of their society. They're also grappling with the fact that they both love and fear men now. Um, which is a very complicated 
place to be, and also sets them into the question of when does a child become a man? When should they fear their sons? And whether or not their sons would be able to go with them if they do leave, uh, because eventually their sons are going to become men who have created all of this tra trauma for them. And then they begin even questioning their faith, because their faith, since they can't read or write, they've never read the Bible. They have no idea what the Bible actually says. They are getting an interpretation of the Bible through a man's lens. And they now have to question that because they've been deceived by men. So can they actually believe the details of the, the commandments of their faith? And does that put their faith in jeopardy? So I pulled out a couple of examples to read from each of these. That's a fairly benign um, sample of the text and doesn't really get into the deeper philosophical um, discussions that are being had in both of these. But in this example, we are really seeing how truly isolated and disconnected these women are from the rest of the world and um, realizing it at the same time as the pro protagonist character that is our perspective. Nearer my God to thee, I begin, is the song that the passengers on the Titanic sang as the ship was sinking. I look at Ona. She says she doesn't know of the ship, but it is the song she would sing as well if she were on a doomed vessel. Maricha adds, and if there was nothing else to be done. Yes, says Ona, if there was nothing else to be done. None of the women in the loft have heard of the Titanic. None of the women in the loft have seen the ocean. Their measured and polite attention to my fact is embarrassing. They are silent, nodding, and giving the fact its due. Such torment in my heart, Titanic. This fact was meant for Ona, but how stupid of me to offer such, such a gift, as though to imply that the women's plan is doomed. How selfish of me. Greta, mercifully, again, suggests that we sing now. The women are respectful in basically all things. They truly consider and give weight to any information that is shared with them. And something that they keep coming back to is that they want a right to think because they don't feel like they have that at present. And so I think that is what's so powerful about this book and how it, how it identifies women. All My Puny Sorrows then is this completely different book where we're in a city setting in Canada and uh, we have these two sisters who grew up in a Mennonite community within the city and we jump through time so we're mostly in a modern setting where they're adults but occasionally we flash back to their childhood to get some context for um, the treatment of their family by the church because they were kind of on the edge of resisting the conservatism of the church. And particularly, Elfrida um, is the one that had real struggles with the constraints of, of their religion. And so they have both, both grown up to be these artistic individuals. So we have um, Yolandi, who is our perspective character, is a writer, and Elfrida is a world-renowned musician. And Elfrida is deeply depressed and suicidal. So she's meant to be going on a massive worldwide tour, and shortly before this tour, she has a suicide attempt. And so now um, everyone is rallying around her in a psych ward, trying to find out why this is happening, really, and trying to understand her and her motivations. Everyone really just wants her to be well and keeps acting like if she can just hang in there, she'll get better. So Yolandi understands her a little bit better. As sisters, they've always had a very close bond. And they have talked over the years about her depression and her struggles. And in that, they almost become matter of fact in the way they talk about it. They joke and um, talk very casually about how deep in depression Alfreda is and how suicidal she is. So Alfreda begins to confide in Yolandi that she she feels like she has a terminal illness, that this mental illness is terminal for her, and that she wants to seek euthanasia and she wants her sister to help her. So to me, I read this and it felt like 
a perfect expression of um, the Pink Floyd song, Wish You Were Here, that line that says we're just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year, because it feels like the two women keep circling around this thing and repeating the same cycle with each other. And it was just such a beautiful expression of that and painful as well. Everyone around Elfrida would breathe a sigh of relief that she's going to be okay, um, but she wouldn't because for her that's the worst thing that could happen. So we have these very conflicting feelings about the situation. For her, life is not relief, it's incessant discomfort. And on the flip side, we have Yoli, who keeps putting her own life on hold. She literally is pressing pause with um, men that she loves, with children, in order to sustain her sister's life, who, who doesn't even want a life. So after Elfrida has posed this euthanasia possibility, um, Yoli has to start questioning internally, does loving her sister mean keeping her alive or helping her die? And is it more traumatic for everyone around her to go through another suicide attempt or to be there to support her as she goes? So both of these books are so powerful for the philosophical discussions that they raise. And I think there are a lot of connections and interconnections between these two in how Tapes expresses herself. So I think in both books, the prose is, it's in the same school, I think, as Ursula K. Le Guin, where it's, it's not quite as minimalist as her, but it's very pared down. It's very um, simplistic in a way. She only uses as many words as she needs. There are two or three word sentences. Uh, she uses kind of the modern style that doesn't utilize quotes um, for dialogue at all. So if you're not fond of that, definitely be aware going in. Uh, in the first book, Women Talking, we're in that transcription, as I said, and um, because we're getting a transcription, it's not just the dialogue, it's also everything that the transcriber is observing happening in the barn. It's kids coming in to disrupt things. There's a pair of teenage girls that are there for the meeting, and they, they keep playing games and goofing off and just generally being disruptive. So it's all of those things happening in All My Puny Sorrows. We are getting from Yolani's head perspective, more of a stream of conscious almost. It's her worries and her trying to maneuver everyone's lives so that everything stays managed. So those things work together in both books to give us a very experiential read because you're very in the perspective of the person that's writing. In both cases, we also have a disconnect from the trauma that I think is more effective than if we were in the perspective of the person experiencing trauma. So we have this transcriber who is a man who he can't have experienced the things these women have experienced in Women Talking, and in All My Puny Sorrows we have Yolandi, who is the sister of the person who is experiencing depression and suicide. And I think it's even more powerful and able to reach the common reader that way. You're in the head of someone being affected by, by caring for others who are going through trauma. In both books as well, these are so woman-focused. These are entirely about groups of women. Even when we are in the man's perspective, everything is centering the women focusing the relationships of women with each other, womanhood as sisterhood, really. So these aren't just about familial relationships, it's also about um, all of women coming together. It's about the challenges of being women, uh, the problems of control of women and their bodies. And in both cases, we have almost a special role of mothers in these books. So one of the very powerful things that I noticed is that in each book there is in the backstory something planted where the mother stood up for their children. In um, Women Talking, the mother was the gateway to education, so she fought for the children to actually be educated. She was teaching her son, who grew up to be the, the transcriber in the story, and another child. And 
after that that led to him leaving this colony. And so they were the gateways to knowledge. Similarly, in All My Puny Sorrows, we also had the mother of these two girls really didn't take it when the elders were coming against them and, and trying to keep the girls within their community, not let them go to university or express their creativity and talent. Um, she really just would not allow them to be suppressed. And so we have this very powerful layered effect through both of these books about the roles of women and the power of women, even when they are in these extremely powerless and controlled situations. So I think that both of these books are really great for the philosophical discussions that they have, the relationships that they explore, and I would highly recommend them to everyone to read because um, they are going to give you such great insights that I think everyone would benefit from. Thank you so much for watching.